Once again, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I trust everyone can hear me. Yes. I trust the wind is not a problem for us today. No. God is going to be good regardless. Amen? Amen. Amen. And we've come for a blessing. And I don't know, you have already been blessed. It was a joy, by the way, to see two young men give their lives to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. It is my prayer that that is just the first fruits of a great harvest to come. And I'm so thankful to be here with you today. Every one of you, when you came in, should have been handed a study guide. It is time to pull that out. Number eight is the number we're on today. Study guide number eight, the title being Antichrist Evidence, Part One. Anytime there's a part one, that's a strong implication that there's going to be a part what? Two. So what we're doing now to this morning is not a complete sermon. If I were to give the entire sermon, we would be going all afternoon, and only I want that. The rest of you do not. So what we've decided to do is take part one this morning, this, this early part of the day, and this evening come back for part two. So if you have come now, you have already signed up to be here this evening. Antichrist evidence part one. Let me tell you something, friends. When you tell people that you're going to be discussing Bible prophecy, many pictures come into their mind. They have pictures of uh, of terrible plagues, they have pictures of beasts that they might have read about or seen in the great apocalyptic prophecies of the Bible, but perhaps one topic is more drawing and more intimidating to many people than the Antichrist. The idea that there is an Antichrist enemy out there is something we need to be aware of, we need to study it, and we need to have confidence that God's Word is true and He will lead us safely until the second coming of Jesus. So I'm assuming that everyone now has a study guide. You'll also need a pen or pencil. And I'm also assuming that every one of us here has a trusty Bible with us. Amen? Now I'm going to be putting some passages on the screen. But as you can see, it's a little faded with the sunshine. The electricity might go off. The tent might fall down. But God's Word will stay the same. Amen? Amen. So that is where our confidence is this morning. But before we study from God's Word, we always need to begin with what? Amen. If you would, please bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this windy, beautiful day of life that you've given us. Thank you for the opportunity to be together, to fellowship, and now to study your word. Lord, we ask and we expect that you will fulfill the promise you gave so long ago, that when two or three are gathered together, you will be here with us in the midst, and that you will send the Spirit of truth to lead us into all truth. For we ask it and we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. In that great book of the Bible, the last book, Revelation chapter 1 and verse 1. Now, let me just start right now and ask a question. Is that so faded that I might as well ignore it? Is it worthwhile or no? Shall we have a vote? No, we don't do that. We'll work with it. Okay, we'll keep working with it. I just want to make sure. Because when in doubt, you always have it in your hand. Amen? Good. Now, the opening lines of that great prophecy book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, opens with the, the statement, the revelation of whom? Jesus Christ. And we open with this in our first message. The book of Revelation, in fact, the entire Bible is there to reveal to us not beasts, not plagues, not terrors, not even the Antichrist. The Bible is written and the prophecies are told to tell us about Jesus Christ, right? The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show his servants things which must shortly take place. It's a book of prophecy looking forward to things to come. And he sent and signified it by his angel to his servant John. Later on in the 12th chapter, right in the middle of the book of Revelation, we find this declaration in verses 10 and 11. Then I heard a loud voice in heaven saying, Now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accuses them before our God day and night has been cast down. I praise the Lord that when Satan sinned first in heaven, Christ cast him out. And when he brought that nonsense of rebellion down to this earth, Jesus Christ came, died on Calvary, and once again cast Satan out of his kingdom. And then it adds, and they, that is the people who Christ died to save, overcame him, that is, overcame the devil, 
by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. So the salvation that we have, the strength that we have, comes only in Jesus Christ. Are we all together with that idea? Okay. The book of Revelation makes that clear. Indeed, the entire Bible, that is the purpose of the Scripture, to point us to Jesus Christ, for in Him and in Him alone we have salvation. In fact, the Gospel of John, Jesus said it this way, the most simply of all. And this is life eternal, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Friends, salvation is found in a knowledge and a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, the question I want to bring to your mind this morning is, if our salvation, our only hope of eternal life, is found in the Son of God, Jesus Christ, and if Satan's goal is to make sure that none of us receive that salvation, his objective would be to keep us away from Jesus Christ, right? His number one goal would be to distract us, to discourage us, to lead us somehow apart from Christ, away from salvation, and to join him in his condemnation. Does that make sense? Right? So here is my question, and I want you to take out your pencil and put it in the study guide as we open up our study of Antichrist Part 1. It is simply this. Is it possible that you can think you're following Jesus Christ but in reality, you're following the Antichrist. Obviously, that's not the ideal. No one would want that to happen. Our goal is to follow Jesus, but Satan wants to distract us. Is it possible we can think we're being loyal to Jesus, when in reality, we're actually following his enemy? And while our mind believes we're following Jesus Christ, in reality, we can be following the Antichrist. Friends, I want to tell you that is possible. Not only do you think it's possible, I think Satan has been quite successful with it, but I praise God his word has given us the antidote to his deceptions. In Revelation chapter 12, again, if we back up, if you recall the original casting out of Satan, the Bible describes it as a war or a polemos in the original language, which means an argument, a, a battle of minds, a war of words says, and war broke out where? In heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon and his angels, but they did not prevail, nor was a place found for them in heaven any longer. So Christ recognized Satan's baleful work and cast him out of heaven. It continues reading, so the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan, who, now watch the next word, who does what? deceives how much? The whole world. Who deceives the whole... Now it does not say he oppresses the whole world or he persecutes the whole world, though he does revel in the opportunity to hurt people. His primary weapon, his choice, his modus operandi for operating his government is deception. Who deceives the whole world, he was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. When Jesus came to this earth, in John chapter 8, he took on the religious leaders of his time who were being unfaithful to their charge and were actually working for Satan. Now, I know that sounds like a bold statement, but look what Jesus himself says. To these religious leaders, he says, You are of your father, the whom? The devil. And the desires of your father you want to do. Now, friends, if you recall... What were the desires of Satan in heaven? He wanted to lift himself up to be worshipped like God, right? And, to, and the Bible also says he was filled with violence within. He wanted to harm and he wanted to self-aggrandize. That's exactly what the religious leaders were doing to Jesus. You are of your father the devil and the desires of your father he wants to do. He was a murderer from when? From the beginning and does not stand in the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Friends, I want to put this in your mind. Not only does Satan tell lies, 
He's the one who came up with the idea of lying. The whole concept of deception comes from him. That is, his signature activity is lying. He patently is a liar and the father of it. Okay? Now, the Apostle Paul dealt with people who put on the pretense of Christianity but were in fact deceivers as well. Look what he had to deal with in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He speaks of others going around teaching different gospel. He said, for such are what kind of apostles? False apostles. So apparently there's such a thing as a false apostle, just like there's a false prophet, there's a false teacher, right? There's falsehood. These are false apostles, and notice what kind of workers they are. Deceitful workers transforming themselves into apostles of whom? Christ. So they come with the appearance of apostles of whom? Christ. But in reality, they're working for Satan. Paul said, watch out for them. And he says, don't worry, they didn't come up with it themselves. He says, no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Now, I don't know if you've seen the popular caricature of the devil, but most people in the world, even in the Christian world, have a false idea of what the devil operates like and what he looks like. You know, you've seen the picture, a red little minion, you know, with little horns and a pitchfork and tail and all this kind of stuff. He's, if someone came up like that to you and said, ah, follow me, no one would say, well, okay, I'm with you. No, we'd reject him outright. How does Satan go about his work? He disguises himself, he transforms himself into an angel of light. He puts on the pretense of godliness, a form of godliness, even the garb of it, if you will, yet he's still balefully working that deceit, right? Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light, therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works. Even in the time of the early church, the Apostle Paul was saying, watch out, just because it claims to be Christian does not mean it is so. Just because it has a form of godliness does not mean it is sincere. Because they're learning this from Satan himself. Deception is how they work. In Matthew chapter 24, speaking of the end times, Jesus himself would declare, Take heed that no one does what? Now, Prince, please take careful note of this. He does not say, take care that no one harms you. You can expect trial and tribulation if you're a Christian. You can expect a persecution to come. But he says, don't let anyone do what? Deceive you. The number one thing to watch out for, people think the number one thing in the end time is war or disaster or disease or famine or plague or other kind of problem. But the Bible, Jesus Christ himself plainly says the number one thing to watch out for as we see the end times coming is what? Deception. Take heed, he said, that no one deceives you. The Apostle Paul, picking up right where Jesus left off, continues the same warning in 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 1. Now listen how emphatically he says this. Now the Spirit expressly says, that means specifically, unequivocally says, that in the latter times, friends, we already studied Daniel chapter 2, are we living in the latter times? Yes. In the latter times, some will depart from the faith, giving heed to what kind of spirits? Deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons. Apparently, Satan will have a message, and he'll have ministers, and it'll seem like Christian stuff. It'll seem Christ-like, but it's deception through and through. And he says, watch out for it. Jesus says, watch out for it, particularly in the time in which we're living. Now, I know you might be thinking, I praise the Lord that I'm not deceived. Now, the problem with that attitude is that's exactly how deceived people think. Right? Right? Let's go to our study guide and use a little logic, shall we? Deception only works when you think it isn't working. If someone can calmly say, oh, good, I'm not deceived, those are the ones the deceiver is most confident in. Oh, yeah. 
So how do you know? That's a weary thing. The worrisome thing is deception only works when you think it isn't working. And the best way, and Satan knows this, the best way to get away with something bad is to make it seem what? Good. So he's not going to come up to you and say, Hi, my name is Satan. I used to be Lucifer. I was cast from heaven. I'm looking for people to join in my rebellion against God. Will you please come join my team? No. How's he going to come across? as winsome and looking good and sounding appealing and even in the name of Jesus. Now, when it comes to the Antichrist power, most people in the world, even in the Christian world, are expecting the wrong thing. Most people in the Christian world, it's been made popular, especially in recent years, through many books and movies and all kinds of lectures you hear about this, that the Antichrist is going to be a sinister politician or a military leader, some obviously evil figure who will appear at the very end of time to openly oppose God and wage war against all Christians. If Hollywood were to make a movie about the Antichrist, they would make it look awful. Rrr, some sinister thing coming out to oppose God's people, away from the church, trying to crush and... But that's not how deception works. And if we saw that Antichrist coming over the hill, we would all say, run! Satan is smarter than sometimes we give him credit for. He does not show up and introduce himself as the Antichrist. Much in the same way a false prophet never introduces himself as such. You would never say, hi, my name is so-and-so and I'm a false prophet. Because the jig is up, right? In order to pass yourself off as true, you got to hide the false, right? Satan is not going to come to you with horns and a pitchfork or some sort of military incursion against the church when everybody would automatically have their defenses up. Satan wants you to lower the shield and welcome him in under the pretense of Christianity. So let's turn our study guides over to the second half now. One power, many names. I like that little picture there. Satan is not going to come along with a sticker that says, hello, my name is the Antichrist. It's not going to work that way. Okay. How will he work? Well, let's first of all break down what the Bible tells us about the Antichrist. One of the little known facts about the Antichrist is you will not actually find the term Antichrist in either the great prophetic books of Daniel or Revelation. That term is not there. Now, that's not to say that the Antichrist power is not mentioned. It's not not named the Antichrist, right? What you'll find is that the name Antichrist, the title Antichrist, only appears in the writings of John in the letters of John, not the revelation that John wrote. But in 1st and 2nd John, we find the term the Antichrist. But you do find other references... You know, sometimes when they get a criminal, they also look at his aliases. He goes by other names, right? The same thing happens with Satan's power on the earth. It's called the Antichrist in 1st and 2nd John, but in, for instance, in Daniel chapter 7 and Daniel chapter 8, where we're going to be looking this evening, he's known as the Little Horn. Same power, just a different name, okay? In the book of Revelation, chapter 13, is known as the beast from the sea. Okay? Same power, different name. And in 2 Thessalonians, of course, Revelation chapter 17 calls her the Babylon the Great Harlot. A very descript term, but for the same power, just a different name. But where I want to focus today, the core of our study will be in the book of 2 Thessalonians. It's there in the Bible in the T section of the New Testament, 2 Thessalonians. Chapter 2, where the Antichrist power is known as the man of sin and the son of perdition. The man of sin and the son of perdition. And before we study there, let me tell you what our purpose of this sermon is. I'm going to lay out something for you that you may not be expecting. The entire presentation today, this morning, is to tell you exactly who the Antichrist isn't. Now, if you want to know who the Antichrist is, you need to come back tonight. 
All we're going to accomplish in our study today is an understanding of who the Antichrist is not. Satan has done a marvelous job of deceiving and confusing the world, even the Christian world, that they have a false image of what this Antichrist power is or will be, and we have to take our time through a study of God's Word to tear away all of those falsehoods and see what the truth is. So we're going to spend today taking down all of those deceptions that Satan has done about the Antichrist and showing you who the Antichrist isn't. When you come back tonight, we'll do the same Bible study, but we're going to see who the Antichrist is, okay? And I'll give you a little extra bonus. When you come tomorrow night, we're going to demonstrate that the Antichrist in these last days has an accomplice who's going to help him out. So this morning, who the Antichrist isn't, tonight, who the Antichrist is, and tomorrow, who is the Antichrist's accomplice, okay? Those are the three things. So as we study today... Our burden is to wrap, peel away those deceptive layers and see who the Antichrist is not. So let's go in our Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul spent a great deal of time preparing the people of his day for the final events of history. And in the book of 1 Thessalonians, don't go there yet, but I'll just make reference to it. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, he told them about the coming of the Lord, and we find great hope in that, that we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with those who have been raised, and we shall be forever with the Lord. Amen? It's a wonderful promise. And so he put their hope on the second coming of Jesus, but in the second letter to that same group of people, in 2 Thessalonians, he had to clear up some misunderstandings. Okay? And in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, we read his teaching. Now, brethren... Concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. Basically, he said, that thing I told you in the last letter, let me give you more detail now about the coming of the Lord. Concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together with him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. He said, yes, Jesus will come someday, but it is not today. Apparently their hopes are getting up and they're saying, oh, Jesus is coming any minute. Jesus is coming right now. This is the day of the Lord. Je and he said, now calm down. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Yes, Jesus is coming, and yes, that coming is soon, but it's not right now. And he started explaining why. Watch what he goes says. Paul explains, and fill in your study guides, Paul explains that before Jesus returns, certain things must take place when? First, he spins this letter to the Thessalonian church, the second chapter there, explaining that before Christ returns, certain things must take place first. And notice what he starts off with. Let no one do what? deceive you by any means. The number one thing that Jesus said to watch out for, he cautions again, let no one deceive you by any means. For that day, speaking of the day of Christ's return, will not come. By the way, friends, aren't you glad the sentence doesn't stop there? Friends, Jesus is coming back, yes? But it will not come unless, he says, the falling away comes when? First, and the man of sin is revealed the son of perdition. What in the world did the Apostle Paul mean by the falling away must come first? I pray he was not talking about our tent. He wasn't talking about a physical structure. He was talking about the body of Christ being split. Now, let me explain it this way. In your study guide, there's a little open blank, and I want you to fill it in. The only thing, the only thing that can fall away, the only things that can fall away are things that were once what? United. For instance, there are a lot of wonderful, beautiful, godly women in this room right now. But not one of them can I divorce. You know why? 
because not one of them is my wife, right? The only one I can divorce, by the way, is the only one I'm not ever going to divorce, right? Is my wife, right? But in order to have, by the way, that term, the falling away, that's the same language as divorce or separation from a spouse, right? So Paul says, don't expect Jesus to come until there's a falling away first, a split, a divorce, right? Now, logic demands that the only things that can fall apart are things that were once what? Together, united, right? So the Apostle Paul warns of a falling away first before Christ comes. So this is not coming from the outside. Apparently there's going to, the man of sin, the Antichrist power, be revealed when a falling away happens within the church. Let's keep studying this a little bit deeper. John chapter 17. Jesus was praying to the Father. And why does, by the way, why did Paul use that term, son of perdition? Did you know that's only two places in all the Bible where that term son of perdition is used. Once in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, what we just saw, and the other time by Jesus himself in reference to a specific individual. Does anyone know who that individual Jesus meant when he said the son of perdition? Judas Iscariot. Watch this now. Jesus praying to the Father says, Those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except one who is the son of perdition that the scripture might be fulfilled he was referring to his disciples and there was one amongst his disciples that he called the son of perdition now let me ask you a question had Judas been part of Christ's disciples yes had he been close and united to Christ yes but did he fall away yes this language of Jesus in reference to Judas was Paul's basis for his teaching in 2 Thessalonians. That in the church, in the body of Christ, there would be a falling away and the son of perdition would be revealed. Okay? Now, Judas, if you were to ask him, even after he had betrayed Christ, would he claim to be a follower of Jesus? Yes even after he had handed him over to the official to be killed, he would still claim to be a disciple, a follower. He would bear Christ's name, be associated with Christ's other followers. From every outside perspective, if you didn't know better, you would think that Judas was a Christian, right? But he was a deceiver within the brethren, right? Now, the Apostle Paul says, in the last days, the Antichrist power will come not from outside the church, but from inside the church. He compares the Antichrist power to Judas, who was not an opposer from without, but a betrayer from within. Matthew chapter 24. Jesus warns of this, how these deceivers will come in the last days. Matthew chapter 24, verses 4 and 5. Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no one deceives you, for many will come, and notice this, how will they come? In my what? Name. Saying, I am the Christ and will deceive many. So the deception to come in the last days will not come from an outside persecuting force, but from within something claiming the name of Jesus and the form of godliness. Jesus says, watch out. You don't have to watch out for a terrible monster. You have to watch out for something that seems safe, but in actuality is deceptive. He said, watch out. In Acts chapter 20, we read these words. The Apostle Paul was winding down his mission, and notice where he said the trouble would come from after his departure. Notice very carefully Acts chapter 20, starting with verse 28. Therefore, take heed to yourselves and to all the flock, by the way, he's speaking to the elders, the leaders of the church where he was at. Take heed to yourselves and to all the flock among which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to shepherd the church of God. He says, I'm leaving, I'm leaving it in your hands and you be careful to guard them well. Why? For I know this. 
After my departure, savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. Right? He says that wolves are going to come in among you. And then he adds this, also from where? Among yourselves. Men will rise up speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after whom? Themselves. That there's going to be people, he said, in the church who will rise up but not to lift up Jesus Christ, but actually to lift people away from him to themselves. He said, watch out, the trouble is not only from without, the trouble is going to come from within. He said, be careful, take heed. Fascinating thought. So we now go back to home base, which is 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Again, he says, let no one deceives you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. Notice what he does. Who opposes and exalts, what? Himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. All that is called God or that is worshipped. Does this bring to mind anything about Lucifer and his original fall from heaven? Sure, he wanted to lift himself up to draw people to himself and to be worshipped as God. We saw that in Isaiah, we saw that in Ezekiel. The, whoever this antichrist power is on the earth is acting out the motives of his father, Satan. Okay? Someone's going to come, apparently, according to the Apostle Paul, from within the church who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is what? God. Friends, this person isn't going to try to lead you away from God. He's going to lead you to a false God himself. Right? Be very, very careful. By the way, notice it says here, in the temple of God. Many people even in the Christian world, are looking to Jerusalem and the literal rebuilding of a physical temple for the fulfillment of this prophecy. They said, oh, the Antichrist can't come first because he's got to build the temple because they said the temple of God is where he will sit. But I want you to notice something. Apostle Paul, interestingly enough, never once refers to the temple of God as the building in Jerusalem. He always refers to the temple of God as being something else. Let's see what he describes it being. In 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 16, notice what he says to the believers in Corinth. He says, you are the what? Temple of the living God. Is Paul talking about a building or is he talking about the body of Christ? Of course, the body of Christ, the church itself, right? He says, you are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk among them. I will be their people, and they shall be my God. He said, you, corporate body of Christ, are the temple of God. And according to 2 Thessalonians, the Antichrist power will try to sit in the temple of God, that is, the church of God, and exalt himself in opposition to God. He's not going to do it from without. He's going to do it from within. Be very careful of this. We see it also in the book of first, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3. It says, For we are co-workers in God's service. You are God's field, God's building. He says, Do you not know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's Spirit dwells in your midst? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy that person. For God's temple is sacred and you together are that temple. So when the Apostle Paul talks about the temple of God, he's not talking about a tabernacle in Jerusalem made with human hands. He's talking about the body of Christ corporately, the people of God, his church on the earth. And that, friends, is where he says the Antichrist power will seek to exalt himself and be worshipped as God, not from without the church, but from within the church. So let's fill in the blanks. When Paul uses the term the temple of God, he always means God's people, the what? Church. And this is another interesting thing. People say, well, wait a minute, it's called the Antichrist. That means he's opposed to Christ, right? 
You're either pro something or you're anti something, as our modern thinking goes. But the term antichrist does not only mean opposition to, but it also means in the place of. A substitute for, if you will. The prefix anti means against, but it also means instead. So when he seeks to be anti-Christ, that doesn't mean he's just against Christ. It means he's trying to be in the place of Christ. Does that make sense? So the way he opposes Christ is to get in between people and Jesus and pull their affections to him and away from Jesus, right? In that sense, he is the anti-Christ in that, yes, he opposes Christ, but he wants to replace Christ with himself. It's the same thing that Lucifer wanted to do in heaven, but now there's a power on earth that's working those motives out on his behalf. It's exactly what we see in Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew, when Jesus was taken up on the high mountain, it says, And the devil took him up on an exceedingly high mountain and showed him all the kings of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these things I will give you if you will fall down and what? Worship me. What is the one thing that Satan has wanted from the beginning of his fall? He wants to be worshipped as God. Period. And now this Antichrist power is trying to fulfill those satanic ambitions. To sit in the church of God, to be worshipped in the place of God, and in so doing to draw people to, themsel to himself and oppose the true Christ, who is Jesus Christ. Okay? This is what he said in the book of Isaiah. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. This is Lucifer at the very beginning. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like whom? The Most High. From the very beginning, Satan's highest ambition is to be in the place of God and to be worshipped as God. He was cast out of heaven but he has found fertile ground for his deceptions here on this earth. His goal with the Antichrist power is not to openly oppose God's people, but to deceive God's people and put himself in the place where Jesus Christ belongs. Let's be very clear about that. Now the Apostle Paul goes on to say in 2 Thessalonians, that's our home base for this message, he goes on to say, now you know what is restraining. So first of all, he talks about there being this power that wants to oppose God and exalt himself as God in the temple of God. But he said something is holding that power back from coming to the forefront and maturing. He says, now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own what? Time. The Apostle Paul understood that yes, Jesus would come, but before that, the Antichrist would arise. And it would come not from outside the church, but from within the church, not to openly oppose, but to subtly betray Christ and draw people to himself. But at the time of his writing, which was during the time of Imperial Rome, Paul said there's a power holding him back from stepping into that place of deception and opposition. And he tells the believers there, you know what is restraining that he may reveal in his own time. Okay? Now I bring in this important fact. According to the Apostle Paul, there would be a set time for the Antichrist to step into that opposition role and begin that self-aggrandizing false ministry, if you will. He says it's not now. So don't expect Jesus Christ to come until the Antichrist has done its baleful work. Okay? So I want to be patently clear about that. Now then he adds this. For the mystery of lawlessness is what? Already at work. Now let's take a moment and think about that. Again, Satan has done a marvelous job deceiving people about the nature of the Antichrist and his power. Most people think the Antichrist will arise in the very last days of Earth's history out of nowhere as a military or political power to openly oppose the people of God from outside the church. 
That's 99% of people's view of the Antichrist when the Bible says exactly the opposite. That apparently he's not going to rise just at the end of time, but apparently according to the Apostle Paul, he said it's already what? At work. In the first century, in the earliest days of the church, Paul said it's already starting to stir. It's already happening now. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. There was a restraining power holding back the development of the Antichrist at this time in world's history. But when that power was removed, that power being pagan Rome, then the Antichrist power would step into that vacuum and be exalted in the place of Christ. Now, watch this now. The Apostle John, who of course wrote the book of Revelation as well, concurs with the Apostle Paul. He says, little children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard the Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have come. The Apostle Paul says it. The Apostle John says it. The Antichrist is not just some end time power. It was in the very first century beginning its work and starting to stir, by which we know this is the very last hour. And notice what he says, they went out from where? From us, but they were not of us because they were not of us. Now notice, he says they came out from within and were already starting to stir this Antichrist power. John says it, Paul says it, so let me ask you a question. Why doesn't the world know this? because they're not giving heed to the scriptures and they're allowing themselves to be deceived. The very thing Christ said, watch out for, everybody says, I'm good, I've got it. And Satan says, those are the people I can work with. Satan can work best deceiving people who are confident that they're not being deceived. And when they step away from the platform of Bible truth, he says, now I've got you. Anytime, friends, we step away from a thus saith the Lord, we are treading on dangerous ground and we should take heed. Run back to the Word of God. 1 John chapter 4, again he says the same thing. He speaks of the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and is now already where? In the world. Let me make this clear, friends. I want to say it over and over. The Antichrist is not merely some end time power. It has been in the church since the earliest days and it has been growing steadily in its deceptive work ever since. This is not a message that the world probably is familiar with, but as Bible-believing Christians, we need to know the truth directly from God's Word. So we're going to review the evidence. Again, the burden of our message today is not to identify who the Antichrist is, even though if you have two cents worth of brains in your head, you're probably starting to put the pieces together. All I want to do today is tell you who the Antichrist isn't, okay? So let's review the evidence. Since knowing Jesus Christ means hope of salvation for us, Satan is continuing his deceptive warfare through his representative, the Antichrist, right? He wants us to not know Jesus Christ, but instead start following the Antichrist, yes? Okay. The Bible explains that the Antichrist will not openly oppose God's people from outside the church, but subtly betray God's people from where? Inside the church. The falling away, the son of perdition, will come from within the church to lead people away from Jesus Christ. Okay? He will not openly oppose God's people from outside the church, but will subtly betray God's people from inside the church. Next we learn... That the, that the Antichrist power will not be a political or military power, but will be an apparently Christian spiritual power. Jesus said, many will come how? In my name, doing what? Deceiving many. Paul said, it's going to come from within. He calls them the son of perdition, a Judas Iscariot, who from all outside looks, looks and sounds and repents, uh, uh, re reveals himself to be purports to be a follower of Jesus, but in reality is actually standing in the place of Jesus to draw people away from him. And finally, the Bible makes clear that the Antichrist will not appear suddenly at the end of time, 
but has indeed been growing from the earliest days of the church. Okay? So we're going to put all these pieces of evidence together and clearly identify that the Antichrist is not from the outside, but coming from within. It's not just an end time power, it's a growing power throughout the history of the Christian church. And it's not a military power, it's not a political power, it's a spiritual power coming in the name of Christ. But watch out. By the way, friends, isn't it good news that Christ has told us about the Antichrist? Wouldn't it be awful if he said, watch out for the Antichrist, and he didn't say anything else about him? And we'd always be like, who is that? I don't know. But the Bible doesn't leave us in a lurch. The Bible makes it patently clear that if we stay focused on Jesus Christ and are faithful to his word, we can unravel and decode all of Satan's deceptions. Whatever difficulty comes along, whatever temptation is forced upon you, whatever deception Satan tries to pawn off, the Word of God is our antidote, right? So today we've learned who the Antichrist isn't. You've got to come back tonight to find out who the Antichrist is. But I praise God that no matter how much we know about the Antichrist, it's only a knowledge of Jesus Christ that will save, right? So we want to learn these things so as not to be deceived, to draw us closer and closer, always and only, to our King Jesus. Let me ask you a question. Despite all the wind and the havoc, has today's presentation been clear? God's name be praised. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the truth of your word and the power of Jesus Christ over the deceptions of the Antichrist. Thank you so much for warning us of the deceptions to come and preparing us to not be deceived but to be eyes opened, minds focused, steadfastly committed to Jesus Christ. Lord, help not one of us here to fall away by the deceptions of Satan, but help each one of us to take hold by faith the hand of Jesus and to stand firmly on a thus saith the Lord. Help this movement to be known as that which follows it is written until the day we see Jesus come we pray that day is soon. And Lord, we also pray that when your Son comes, that not one here will be missing. For we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.